I'm holding in my hand here samples of five different isotopes. They have fancy names like cobalt-60, strontium-90, thallium-204. These isotopes have been specifically chosen, purified, and packaged to show the phenomenon of radioactivity, which explains all the scary symbols on there. I can detect this radioactivity with the help of my handy radiation monitor here. For example, the cobalt-60, when I bring it close, maybe you can hear that. Ooh, here's strontium-90. Mmm, nice. And cesium-137. And thallium-204. The radiation monitor makes a beep every time radiation goes in and gets detected by the electronics inside. Now, I would expect the ones labeled radioactive to be radioactive, but other things are radioactive too, including myself. Hear that? Whoa. There are radioactive particles coming out of me also because I am made of some atoms that are radioactive, like carbon-14 or potassium-40 from the banana I ate this morning. Nowadays, we've probably all heard of isotopes and just maybe even take for granted that they even exist. But who discovered isotopes? And how did anybody discover that they're radioactive? Turns out the answers to those questions happen in the reverse order. In 1802, John Dalton published what is now considered the first modern atomic theory. And in it, he said things like, all matter is made of atoms, and all atoms of an element are identical, which made sense for the time because all atoms of oxygen behave the same, all atoms of iron behave the same, and it weren't like there were atoms of gold running around doing weird things. They were all the same. But the way an atom reacts with another atom is dependent on the electronic structure of the atom how many electrons it would want to give away or snatch from other atoms. The stuff going on in the nucleus is hidden underneath all those shells of electrons, so it went unnoticed for a while after John Dalton's work. Later on, though, in 1896, it was discovered by Antoine-Henri Becquerel, a French scientist and engineer, that some phosphorescent samples of uranium were emitting some kind of ray or something that would penetrate whole sheets of paper and, and put an image on a photographic plate. He first tested this outside in the sunlight, thinking that the sunlight was responsible for the phosphorescence. But a series of cloudy days caused him to take it inside and put it in a cupboard or a drawer. And he came back later and found that they were exposed in exactly the same way, even though there was no sunlight. So somehow, spontaneously, these atoms of uranium were giving off the rays by themselves. This spontaneous emission of particles and energy from atoms would later become known as radioactivity. And Becquerel, for his work, not only won the Nobel Prize in 1903, but he also got the unit of radioactivity named after him with the lowercase b, the Becquerel. One of the first to get in on the action was Marie Curie, who worked with radium and actually discovered polonium by the radiation given off by it. And she also, along with her husband Pierre, won the Nobel Prize in 1903. By 1913, over 40 radio elements had been discovered, and they all had atomic weights and masses that put them between lead and uranium on the periodic table. But this was a problem because lead and uranium are only 10 spots apart on the periodic table, so some explaining needed to be done. Frederick Soddy was an English chemist who worked alongside several notable people, including Mr. Ernst Rutherford, who, you might recall, did a little thing like discovered the nucleus. Soddy worked with Rutherford, and was studying radioactive decay chains, which are lists of radio elements as they appear in multiple steps after, as a nucleus decays. Most of those 40 radio elements we talked about earlier had names that related them to the elements they came from, like mesothorium or thorium X. Saudi was able to observe that when an atom gives off an alpha particle, its atomic number goes down by two because it emits two protons per alpha particle. But oddly, when an element emits beta radiation, its atomic number goes up by one. So if an element were to give off an alpha particle and then two beta particles, you would be back to having the exact same number of protons as you did before. So you would be back to having an atom of the original element, but just four units lighter and with slightly different nuclear properties. Saudi was also a really awesome chemist. And as hard as he tried, some of those radio elements, he could not chemically separate from themselves. They were chemically indistinguishable from each other. And so he correctly put all this together and deduced that 
some of these radioisotopes were simply atoms of the same element with different weights. They had different names up to this point, but he was the one that correctly put it all together. These different radio elements were actually the same radio element, and so they should belong in the same place on the periodic table. And in fact, his friend, Margaret Todd, who was a writer, actually suggested the name isotope, which means in the same place. And Saudi thought that was a great idea, so the term isotope was born. So it turns out that mesothorium was actually an isotope of radium, radium-228. And thorium X was also an isotope of radium, radium-224. That, along with the known isotope of radium-226, gave three distinct isotopes of radium. Saudi was unable to chemically separate the three, so he correctly deduced that yes, in fact, they are three isotopes of the same element. Soon after, J.J. Thompson, of plum pudding fame, was also able to demonstrate that other atoms, not just the radio elements, could have isotopes. He was able to produce a stream of neon atoms inside a canal ray tube, and it actually broke into two rays, and he correctly deduced that there was two isotopes of neon, one heavier and one lighter than the other. Nowadays, we think it's normal for isotopes to exist, and we have these lovely charts of all the different isotopes that are known. And we know that they have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons, and that they ultimately have different masses because of that. And here we get to something I find interesting. For a long time, people were studying isotopes and their masses and their properties, but people didn't know about the neutron until, get this, 1932. That's like 19 years after Frederick Soddy discovered that isotopes exist. So for 19 years, everybody knew they had different masses, but nobody knew why. James Chadwick was another English scientist who in 1932 determined the existence of the neutron. He did this partially by repeating some experiments done by other people and running his own new ones and interpreting the results. By 1930, it was shown by several other chemists that if you took high energy alpha particles from an element like polonium and bombarded a lighter element like beryllium with it, you would get an entirely different kind of radiation. But their results were difficult to interpret and so nobody really knew what this radiation was. It was also shown that if you took this new stream of radiation and bombarded something with a lot of hydrogen in it, like paraffin wax, you would get protons ejected in all directions uh, of very high energy. And no one knew what to make of this. James Chadwick recreated these experiments and added some of his own, and he correctly deduced that that new type of radiation was a stream of uncharged particles with approximately the same mass as protons. So he was credited with discovering the existence of the neutron it should be noted that these guys are just grabbing trophies left and right because Frederick Soddy won the Nobel Prize in 1921 and James Chadwick won the Nobel Prize in 1932. So with the discovery of the neutron, the fundamental nature of the nucleus could be explained as well as all those different masses for all those different isotopes. Isotopes can now be explained as atoms of the same element with the same number of protons but with different numbers of neutrons and therefore different masses. Good old John Dalton, he was right about some things, but not about all atoms of an element being identical. With the discovery of isotopes and later neutrons, we now know that all atoms of an element are not identical. So my cobalt 60 here with its 27 protons and 33 neutrons is just one of several isotopes of cobalt. See you next time.